Hey guys, it's Eric, owner of Farpoint Farms, and tonight I have something completely different to share with you. Uh, something that a lot of you may or may not be familiar with, something that dates back to uh, the beginning of uh, personal computing. And uh, probably can't imagine that a farmer or a homesteader or a prepper or whatever it is you want to uh, consider me, uh, a mechanic obviously, would be into stuff like this. But uh, the truth is, I actually built this computer many, many years ago. It didn't look quite like this. In fact, it was a Sinclair ZX81 computer kit. And uh, in 1981, those kits cost $99. You got them through mail order. Here's a picture of what one looked like unassembled. And here's a picture of a, a stock one. It's a very small computer. It used a membrane keypad. And if I tilt this up, you can see that I actually have the membrane keypad cut off and, and glued on here. And the reason for that is that each one of these keys for this keyboard that I added assigns itself, yes, the letter, but it also has several other things, and I'll show a close-up of what that screen looks like. So each key had multiple functions. And that was kind of unique to the uh, to the Timex Sinclair 1000 or ZX81. But anyway, I purchased the kit uh, through mail order in 1984, and it was like $29 at that point. They were, they were pretty well going out of business at that point, and so they were giving these things away. I bought it, I built it, it took a lot of time with a soldering iron, but I managed to create my own first computer. And as a result, I've always had a soft spot for these little things. And I've kept this. I built this myself using that board that I built in, in 1984, probably early 90, uh, 85 when I, when I finally put it together. Uh, I then went out and found a surplus keyboard. This came off of, a, I think it was a teletype machine, but the keyboard was there. I had one broken key, but that key doesn't do anything, thankfully. And I was able to take that and solder it into the motherboard so that these keys would correspond correctly to that little computer. And then I built this nice little case to go around it. Now, originally, it plugged into a TV set on channel 3 or 4. But sometime in the uh, late 90s, when uh, things started to go digital, uh, the TV set started to have you know RCA inputs, and I decided uh, that because it was always kind of a fuzzy picture, that go in there and remove the circuit to make it a channel two or three, and just go straight to an RCA input, which was easy to do on this because it doesn't have sound; it's just just a video signal. So then it became a composite uh, output, and at which point I picked up this at a Goodwill, which is a, an old uh, Apple Two C monochrome monitor. It's a little nine-inch monitor. And it works perfectly, excuse me for a second, and it works perfectly for the task because the, the screen, it's only a 32 character per line screen, so it really shows up well. And then I did what's called a reverse video mod, which is to make it instead of a black screen with white letters, um, or I'm sorry, initially it had a, a, a white screen with black letters, but on a monochrome monitor I reversed that, so it's a black screen with, uh, with white letters, or in this case green for monochrome. Let me go ahead and uh, plug it in. I'll turn it on. It doesn't have any on-off switches. You just plug it in. And there it is. You come up with your, your K. Uh, now, like I said, each button has several functions. So I want to uh, I want to print uh, you know, a very basic program. So I'm going to type in my line number and a space. And then I'm going to type in my command. In this case, P also doubles as print. So one keystroke, P made it go to print. You can fast forward this video if this is boring you, but this is going to be a very simple demonstration of what basic programming was in 1981. And then you're going to have the uh, same P is also going to be your quotation marks with shift. And then you can type as normal. And then I'll hit enter. And that's telling me now that this entered into memory. And then we hit run. And as you can see, a basic program is actually working. That is how basic worked. You had to enter in your own programs or 
Uh, what this came with was a set of cables, and its method for saving and loading programs was this. And that is a cassette tape, the same type you'd use in your car stereo or house stereo. Uh, this is probably the last cassette tape that I have. It's a Tandy computer certified C10. It only runs five minutes on each side, but it's a real high quality tape. And you would save your programs to tapes like this and hope that they would save and then reload them and hope that they would reload. That's what the world was like in 1981, and it's what my experience was with my first computer. Now, time passes. Uh, I, uh, over the years, I've picked up some pretty cool accessories for this thing, and I've used them. Uh, the first one, which I can't plug in and use anymore because there's just no way to do it, is this, which is called the Biteback Module. It's an RS-232 serial port connector. As you can see, this plugs into the uh, uh, port on the back, this, the uh, expansion slot, and then it's a serial port, and you can plug that into a modem and dial out. And I've actually used this with a BBS program to dial out to uh, several bulletin board systems back in the old days, way before the Internet was around. That would have been like... Uh, Oh, Commodore 64, Apple IIs, uh, TRS 80s, computers like that that were running bulletin boards at 300 baud or 1200 baud. I had an external 1200 baud modem and I was actually able to uh, connect and read messages and post messages on a computer as simple as this with one kilobyte of memory. That's not one megabyte and not one gigabyte, one kilobyte, which is 1000 bytes. Each byte is a single letter single letter is a byte. Pretty amazing, huh? I also at some point came across this uh, printer here. So let me go ahead and unplug this for a second and I'll pause the camera and I'll hook the printer up and I'll show you that it still works in 2018. Okay, I've got the printer hooked up and uh, I've typed in a small program. Now there was a word processing program available for it at some point, but uh, I have no idea where it would be at this point. However, using BASIC you can enter in uh, manually to print letters and text on, on uh, individual lines. So let me go ahead and run that program and you'll hear the printer do its thing. And there it is, it's done. I'll go ahead and rip this off. Get it close to the camera. Hopefully, you guys can read it. So, uh, even all these years later, that's functional. Now, I have this set up uh, because I do play with it every now and again. Uh, I actually wrote some programs for it uh, over the years that have helped out, uh, mostly uh, record keeping stuff, databases. I've even did some financial planning <laughs> in my early days on my own with a computer like this. But let me unplug it again, I'll pause the camera again, and then I'm going to show you uh, a modern solution to some very old problems. So hang in there one second, I'll go ahead and unplug this, and I'll also unplug the printer and set it aside. There we go. All right, got the computer hooked back up here. Uh, so let me show you what, uh, what I use 99.9% .9 of the time now, and that would be this. This is called the ZX Band. This one has the AY uh, edition on it, which is just audio and uh, a, a game port. So if you look on this side, it takes a regular old-fashioned SD card. And uh, this is a 32 megabyte SD card. Surprisingly, if you loaded every single program that was ever made for this computer uh, onto that chip, you'd probably have about three quarters of that 32 megabytes left. You know, at 16 kilobytes per program max, you're talking a whole lot of space when it gets into the megabyte range. Uh, over here you'll also see there is a uh, plug-in for audio, so you can uh, now produce music with this computer, which is something it never came with originally. Now, I've never played with that function, but uh, there are some games that have been made recently that do offer that function. Then on the back, and this is also kind of neat, there's never a joystick made uh, for the Timex Sinclair or the ZX81. That also is added on this little adapter. So that's kind of a neat thing to have. And then it also adds a reset button, uh, which is also cool to have. So let me go ahead and plug this thing in. And what we're going to see is we take a computer from 1981 and we turn it into something extremely useful uh, in the modern era. And by useful, I mean you can play with it without driving yourself crazy trying to find a tape deck and, and getting things to work. But let me go ahead and plug it in. Check this out.
Wow, it's like a Windows-based operating system. Uh, and I didn't say a Windows operating system, but a Windows-based. And it makes this so much more useful here in the modern era. I can now scroll through uh, like you would with uh, any program, right? And I can go right down. Let's go to look at some apps here. We've got graphics, we've got indexing, we've got all kinds of IRA planning, calculators, notepads, uh, even a, a, a terminal program, which I'll get into into the little video I'm making. So let's go back up here and we'll back out of here. And uh, but it, like the menu system is is very DOS like, uh, and I love it. I mean, it reminds me of DOS shell from when I was younger. You've got the uh, menus broken down. I have different games. So obviously, that's the main focus of these things nowadays. Would be to play games on it. And let's go ahead and load one up, and I'll show you what it looks like. Oops. <laughs> When they say press any key to start, they don't mean space. Oh, here we go. Oh, I have no idea how to play it. But everybody knows Scrabble. Give you an idea of the graphics capabilities. And I'm dead. We'll go back here. I believe I have Asteroids, Frogger, stuff like that. So I'll show you some of those games here. And then and I'll show you what it was like to play games back in the day on one of the earliest computers out there. Uh... Here is a terrible Pac-Man ripoff. You know, the Time Max didn't have uh, any real graphic system. Later on, people dis devised high-resolution graphics, but this is as much uh, graphics resolution as you're going to get. You've got your Pac-Man here. Those are ghosts. They're inverted. These are your dots. I imagine the asterisks were uh, power pills. So uh, it's functional, but it's, you know... <laughs> this is a teaching program showing some of the very limited graphics capabilities. We have a four-stroke engine, and it's going to show the uh, four strokes of the engine. So this may not seem very impressive, but in 1981, this would have been uh, top of the line. This would have been the YouTube of its day. But if you had an Atari, which came out in 78, so it actually predated this, or 77, I think it came out, uh, those games would have been a whole lot better. So I don't know how many people actually played these back in the day, but I know I did because this is what I had. Galaxian, very similar to the actual Galaxian. Move your little guy around here. I can't remember which one Fire is, but <laughs> anyway, Galaxian is one of the many games. Oh, I think there's even a Tetris clone that somebody came out with, uh, you know, sometime in the future. Crazy Kong, that would be your, uh, yeah, that would be, you know, your Donkey Kong ripoff. There it is. Crazy Kong. <laughs> so this computer could do a lot of what other computers could do, but they did it a lot slower and without the graphics or sound. So uh, this iteration with the ZX band is just so cool, man. It's definitely the future. And uh, I love being able to not have to worry about my tape deck and all that stuff. I got rid of all that stuff, sold it on eBay last year, and now I just use this. Uh, so to wrap this up, I'm going to load up ZX Term. And I would say this is probably the fanciest piece of software they ever made for the ZX. Uh, let's see, I believe it's in apps. Yeah, down towards the bottom here. Yeah, ZX term. Now this is a very, very customized program. It's all machine code and it operates fairly quickly. Whoever, uh, Fred Nockenbauer, I can't pronounce your last name, my friend, but whoever you were back in 1987, thank you so much. Super cool. So this program allowed you to you dial out to a BBS at 110 baud or 300 baud, and it worked only. Well, it didn't just work only in 32 byte, uh, you know, letters here. We had 32 letters per line, but this one could also emulate 40, 60, or even 80, and that's why it was ZX term 80. So neat. Um, it's asking me what modem I'm using. I had a byte back. And uh, no, no special printer. We're just going to go through these. And there it is. As you can see, the font is customized. So he, this is all in high res. Now, this is your area that you're going to type your ADTT commands. And then you're going to have uh, your text scroll bottom down here, which is great. Now check it out. I'll, I'll change the display. Oh gosh, how do I do that? I think it was shift. Uh, there we go. So here I have my 40 column, 60 column, or 80 column. I'm going to go to 80. And now you can see, maybe you can't see because it's so small, but those are 80 column uh, 
letters. Now, here's the two issues with that. That actually worked fairly good on a television set. So I've got this reversed because I have my reverse video mode on, but normally that would be green, this would be black, your text would be green, and just like a monochrome uh, IBM system, the text is actually very crisp when it's green on a black screen. Obviously this screen is super small, but on a 19 inch TV or even a 13 inch, it was readable. And so I could log on to 80 column IBM based BBSs uh, well past when this thing probably should have been doing so. Now it definitely had limitations, but it was really neat. So that's your 80 column mode. We'll go in and change it to uh, 60 just so I can show you the differences here. And there's a lowercase g, there's an uppercase g. And then we'll go in and change it again to 40 column, which would have been like your Commodores and uh, ColecoVision, I think, or, you know, the Coleco Atom. All the 8 bits, you know, the lower end 8 bits were either 32 or 40 columns. So 40 column usually worked great for those. So there it is in 40 column. So pretty neat. Pretty neat. Anyway, I'm Eric, owner of Farpoint Farms. This was a, a somewhat of a different type of video for me to make, but I, I felt like I wanted to do this. I wanted to share it. It's snowing outside. I decided to play with this thing a little bit and uh, figured I'd share it with the world because I don't think there are more than a handful of these left in, in the uh, country as far as operational. And this one being home built uh, with a custom keyboard and a custom monitor mod and all that stuff, I imagine it's one of the rare ones. Probably the only one like it here in the United States. If you like this video, maybe you will consider liking and subscribing. And I'll see you next time because I do all kinds of videos. Not just tractor videos, not just CV videos, not just farming or homesteading videos. But I do do electronics. Sometimes I do cooking. And uh, I'm going to be doing some history lessons here shortly too. So stay tuned.